Hello, everyone. I'm happy to see um, there are people here with us tonight. My name is uh, Teodora Georgieva, and I'm part of uh, Hack Bulgaria and one of the organizers of Django Meetup uh, in Bulgaria. Tonight, we organize uh, Django Meetup uh, for second time online, and uh, Ivalo Donchev is with us. He's a software developer. Uh, hello, Ivo. Uh, he software developer at Hacksoft, and uh, tonight's talk is going to be about rules of thumb for queries optimization. So uh, I just wish you good luck, and later we will continue with questions and answers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And let me share my entire screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. I see. What about the rest? Sorry? What about the rest? If everybody uh, are seeing it. Yeah, I, I can stop I can stop the camera if it's going to break. I think. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, great. So, okay, we're going to talk about uh, rules of thumb for query optimization. But first, a few words about me. My name is Sivo. I'm 24. I'm uh, part from uh, Hacksoft. Uh, I'm working with Django for four or five years. We were basically using Django in most of our projects. Uh, and, and we are using Django with DRM. I mean, DRM is almost a replaceable part of Django. And I really love playing with it. I really love reading the implementation because it is kind of long-term investition to learn about it because Django will use DRM to it use any relational database. And I prepared some tips for how we usually deal with uh, queries with heavy views and APIs, how we usually op optimize uh, heavy data fetching from database. And all, all we will need are these three tools. So all the examples use the Django REST framework because it's uh, it is the most popular API framework for Django, and it provides really nice interface for previewing uh, the HTTP responses in the browser. And we'll see the rest for after that. Okay, this picture shows the basic MVC architecture for every uh, web application. And what's usually happening is that the user opens the browser. The browser or the front end, the left part, is sending an HTTP request to the Django, which is the controller. And Django is sending one or more SQL queries to a database to fetch some data and it's returning some response. And this is basically the the pattern that all list or the detail APIs use. But just a thought, the main job of the list and detail APIs is just to forward data from the database to the front end with as minimum job from the application as possible. What that means is that the database is uh, good at collecting data, it's good at storing data, it's good at uh, making data Calculations, the Django and the Python are good at providing business logic. They are good at just forwarding the data from the, the database to the front end. So here is an example of a simple Django REST framework API. What we have here is uh, a class simple API view, which has a get method. 
handle the, the get request. And uh, REST framework serializer, which basically serializes some Django RM model instance. Um, and if we if we open this API in the browser, we won't see the raw HTTP response. We'll see this kind of beautiful uh, page which shows the HTTP response rendered object by object. And I'm going to I'm going to show a demo in the code. It's half a presentation, half a demo. So. If you see my right part on the screen, that's the second tool. Uh, that's the first tool, the Django Debug Toolbar. Django Debug Toolbar is a third party uh, application for Django that puts a middleware in every, every request and tracks every single SQL query made to the database. So I prepared some demo project, which I'm going to run now. Run server. Uh, demo. Okay, I hope you see my screen clearly. Uh, this is showing the HTTP response, and the right part has a SQL section in the Django debug toolbar. If I click on it, it says you have made one query, which is a select query, and it says the exact stack trace where this query is uh, being sent. So that, that's how all, all the examples in the presentation will look like. It's just an API and a browser page where we can see the result. So here's a thought on the, the common problems that we face with the fetch APIs. By fetch APIs, I mean list or detail APIs. Uh, most of the times, the APIs are slow because we are making too much SQL queries to a database. And we are making too much SQL queries because uh, we haven't used our SQL joins wisely or we are making some calculation in the Django code. Or the other, the other problem is that some of the queries is slow. And this is a really common, common corner case with the Django RM to make a redundant SQL logic hidden in the in the query. And sometimes we just need to tweak our queries to, to optimize our queries on a SQL level. And here's our first use case. It's the most common use case that we hit when using the RM. Is the n plus one select queries program. So we, we have two models, full and bar. Bar has a foreign key to full, so one full has multiple bars. And we have two four loops. The first loop is iterating over all the bars and access all the full names. What this code will make, it will make one query for all the bars and then it will make one query per object for all the bars to, to fetch the full relation. And the other case is the opposite. We, we iterate over all, all the full objects and then we iterate over all the bar objects and get something. And this is why it's the, the end object plus one for all the objects from the query set. And Django provides a really intuitive interface to solve this. And it's the select related and prefetch related, related uh, functions. What they do is that they handle the joins. If we, we were dealing with row SQL, we would select all, all the bars and we would join the bars table to the full, full table and have all this data automatically in one query. 
the only way to achieve this is to select related. The opposite one is the preferred related. If you have a model which someone else has a relation to, you, you want to, to join the other table and have all the objects with one query. And we have a simple API. Let me open the code. We have a simple API that fetched all the article objects. Article is some model in the database. All the article objects gets the first 200 and uh, pass it through the article serializer. Uh, where one of the properties, the author name, is uh, accessing one of the relations, the author. So, if we see the models, the article has a foreign key to the author. So, when we open the API, we'll see one query for the articles and 20 queries one for each article to fetch uh, all the authors. It's taking some time to load. Yep. So if you want to solve this, we just need to put the select related. And it will just make one query, which query will uh, contain the inner join between both of the tables. So here's the first row of the first uh, keystone. Uh, if you have a relations, the select related and prefetch related methods are the way to deal with them. But here we have two more models, invoice and invoice item, where the invoice item has a relation to the invoice. So one invoice has multiple invoice items, and one invoice item has its price calculated as the quantity multiplied by the unit price multiplied by the tax, because we always have some tax. And the invoice total amount, total price, is just the sum of all the invoice item prices. So we have another API. We have API where we want to uh, show all the invoices and for each invoice show all the price. Uh, I have prefetched the items, so this will make one query. I'll just open the, the example in the browser. Loading. Okay, this will take some time. Uh, we have prefetched all the items for each invoice, and what the serializer will do is that it will iterate over each invoice and calculate the total price, which is a sum of all items' price which price is a result of this equation. Uh, and here we have, maybe the example is not. Okay, I've removed the perfect related. Related items. This should make just one query. Okay, the API, the API took uh, two seconds and a half just to calculate all the prices here. If I remove the total price from the serializer, it makes a huge difference because uh, we skip all the calculations made by the Python code, which is basically so. Uh, and the API will return the result. Uh, 
it's it's most of the data that that's so such 800 invoices and uh, this is not this is not a good way to calculate something like the total price we have simple math calculation that uh, we made the jungle to uh, calculate for each invoice uh, but as we said, the, the main goal for each list or detail API is just to fetch some data from the database and forward it to the front end. Uh, the good way to do this, if, if we were dealing with uh, row SQL, we would just make um, data uh, SQL annotation, which will just calculate on a SQL level, on a database level, all these prices then group by all the prices for each item and add it to each invoice. So if you want to do this in Django, we will do something like, I'm just going to open my shelf. Plus. Okay, we have the invoice item uh, model. The logic for calculating the price for the invoice item is quantity multiplied by unit price multiplied by tax. If I want to calculate this on a SQL level, I need to say invoice item objects dot annotate annotate means uh, everything inside it every keyword argument inside the annotate is uh, sql annotation appended in the in the select clause of the query so i can say total price equals to expression wrapper which means that I'm putting a SQL expression inside where expression is F. F means uh, get the, the object itself on SQL level, the, the object itself a certain column. And the column here is the quantity multiplied by unit price multiplied by one plus uh, tax. And the expression wrapper means, uh, needs uh, an additional keyword argument, which is an output field. Because we are making some database um, logic, but the Django doesn't know what type, what, what the output of this logic is. So we need to say to the ORM, okay, this is some database calculation. And the output of this calculation needs to be put in such field. For example, here the output field uh, should be model dot decimal field. And if you run this, of course, all the brackets. Uh, one more bracket here. I need to import. Okay, import models. So I can say any name what I want here in the outdate query. For example, uh, underscore total. I'll just save all the items in some variable. And if I get the first item, I'll have this property attached here. And if I print the, the query, I'll see that my logic is put here in uh, 
some cast expression which will handle all of all of what what the property uh, does and what I still need to do is to calculate all this what I just did and group by all the items per invoice and append the result to each invoice so I'm going to write this in the demo project okay I have the invoice I have predefined the invoice query set and I, ha I have uh, defined a collect method collect is just a sample name for what we're going to do is uh, some method that will handle all the annotations at the moment the collect is just equal to dot all so if I say invoice item dot object dot collect is the same like um, this invoice dot collect is the same like saying dot all so we need we need to get all the invoice items um, annotations and group them by invoice so what I need to say is annotate the total price I'll put an underscore before this not to conflict with the uh, model field model property and it will be the result if the group by of all the invoice items the way to do a group by with Django is making a subquery which accepts a query set query set argument and output field argument the output field argument is uh, a decimal field again the query set argument is uh, invoice item objects filter we need just the invoice items for this invoice so the invoice of each invoice item is equal to uh, outer ref outer ref means th this, this query set executed in the context of the sub query of the group by so we need to somehow access the outer query of the sql of the, of the whole query and the way is outer ref the outer ref accepts a string argument uh, that points to a column of the invoice query in the, in the example and I need all the invoice items filtered by invoice where the invoice is equal to uh, the invoices ID column it's a second uh, people hmm. are just texting could you please zoom in can Sorry? you please zoom in Yep. Okay. I can. Uh, is it better now? Uh, let's wait for for a few seconds. I hope it's better. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what we're doing is making an annotation to the invoice where we we have some new property total price which is equal to subquery of the whole query where the subquery I'll just make uh, I'll just move this in some variable to make it more readable items subquery items sub query okay and uh, I need the items query set here which is this part uh, items query set okay So we have all the invoice items for this uh, invoice. Then we need to somehow group them by the invoice itself. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to do that with your M. The way to do it is to say uh, dot values list 
by the thing I want to group the, to group the item by, which is the invoice. Uh, invoice. Then I want to get just the annotation again virus list the group by class. So what I'm doing is first filter all the voice items for the, the given invoice. Then I'm saying group them by the invoice and at the end give give me some annotation for them. So I need to put I need to put the result expression here in the last virus list. And the expression here is the expression I just made in the shell. It was the annotation for the uh, total price. For the price, sorry, for the price property. So I'll just copy it from the shell. I'll just copy the whole thing here. Okay, this is the price annotation. I hope you can read this now. So I'll say annotate uh, price equal to price annotation. This part is what we did in the shell before that. Then we want to say, give me the sum. Sum is uh, embedded function in the ORM. It uses the SQL, uh, the, the database sum function. And we need to say the name of the field here, price. Uh, let me check if I have made a mistake somewhere. So query. Uh, what it says? Missing content. Okay. Okay. I'm going to run this in my shell again. Or start in the shell. Oh, invalid syntax. It's dot filter uh, missing the uh, backslash. And again, the output field missing call. Okay, I'm going to run the shell plus because it uh, automatically imports all the models uh, and settings in the in the shell. Saves a lot of work. Invoice dot object dot collect. The expression wrapper is not defined. Django DB models import expression wrapper. And again. It's not defined. Uh, yes, statement. We have some and other of um, Django DB import models. Some and other of something else. So query. Okay, it should be working now. Ah, damn tap. And we need to reload the shell every time to get the new change. Okay, we have now the, the annotation and I'll just get the first invoice again. And how did I name the property? It's the total price. Uh, 
is total price, which is zero here. And uh, if the subquery don't return anything, it just return none. I'll print all the query sets uh, total prices. And they're either none or uh, the result. And this is really, really faster than calculating it uh, into a model property. And if I print the query here, it looks like that. It says select the annotation that we made, group by invoice ID, and all of this is put in the select class of the, of the query. So So yeah, here's here's the annotation in the, from the example. Uh, I have put put the annotation and the, here the, the second rule of thumb is that use database annotations wherever you can because it saves a lot of time of your Django application uh, and really makes the API faster because it uh, makes the Django skip the work it's not supposed to do. And here is some quick list of the ORM select query lifecycle. We have four steps to execute the query. The first one is construct. It's basically appending all the filters, excludes, and everything to construct the SQL query. The second part is the compile. Uh, the ORM have a SQL compiler part, which translates the ORM structure from um, from from the structure that's made by the filter chains to the SQL dialect for the database management system you are using. For example, for for Postgres, uh, we don't have much control here. It's automatically done by the ORM, but we have full control from for all of the other steps. The next step is execute the query. This is the moment when your code actually sends a SQL query to a database. And as it sends the query, it loads the result of this query into low-level uh, Python structures, which are usually just a list of tuples in the format you're fetching the data. And the last step is loading the database data into the actual ORM structures that we are using. For example, the DRM object from Dotto. So what we just did with the first two rule of thumbs is just constructing the query. The annotate is part of this, the, the filter and exclude are part of this. And we are, we are done with it. So let's see this code example. I hope you see it. Uh, we have some multiple random query set expressions and looking at this, it's not quite obvious where, the, where exactly the code is making a query to a database. I mean, we see some query sets, but for example, the first one with the print, we're comparing two query sets that will actually make a select queries to a database. And what will they compare the, the objects that will fetch or or the query set object itself? And I don't know about you, but it takes me some time to <laughs> get how, how is this actually working. Uh, so what the ORM does is when you create a query set and start appending filters to it. It makes a mathematical tree, which is the query set itself, and it has a, the query object attached to it. The query object is some Python class, and the query object has these queue objects attached to it. The queue objects are all the nodes in the where class of the query. And it's all put in an immutable mathematical tree. So every new filter chain is a whole new tree. 
And when you change whatever filter you want to change, it's a whole new query set. So you cannot compare to query set at all. And I'm not going to open the Django source, which I'm not sure how it will look on the stream. We have the query set class implementation in Django, which has this iter method. Iter method is the Python class method for uh, for showing that something is a generator. And what the query set iter method does is it calls the fetch all, and fetch all is saying. If I have the result cache, the result cache is the, the objects fetched from the database. If I have the objects fetched from the database, just return them. Uh, if I haven't, it iterate over some iterable class of the query set and then save it to the result cache and return it. And this is a tricky part. So what we see here is that the query set is actually a generator and the select query is being made as soon as the iter method is called. And we can easily check that if we open the shell, and this is the third tool we are going to use. Django extensions add a new column to the main API uh, called shell, shell plus. Shell plus provides a new argument called print SQL which basically allows you to see the database queries at the moment you type, type the code. So if I say invoice.objects.all, I'll see the exact query I've made. And if I get all the invoices, All invoice here, I haven't made any query. If I call the first iter method, I'm just triggering the query. If I call it more times, I haven't, I don't do anything because uh, it's all saved in the result cache of the query set class. So when I'm trying to optimize any query, uh, my my rule of thumb here is that the query set is a generator. And the fact that this is a generator uh, is used to trigger a query. At the moment you start iterating over the query set, it's making a query. And if we go back to the example here, if you go back here, the first line is comparing to two query sets. No iterator method is called, so there's no query here. Uh, the second one is casting both of the queries that at least will, which will trigger the uh, iteration over all of it, and we we'll make two queries. Uh, this one will save the query set to a variable, but it won't trigger anything. But the for loop below it will. The second for loop will not trigger a query because it's already saved in the result cache. And the last one will trigger because the query set is an immutable mathematical tree and every filter, every method chain on it is a completely different object. And that's, that's pretty useful when you try to debug why some piece of code is making a uh, hundred queries where each one. And we saw that the iter method is calling some iterable class to iterate from. And the iterable class defines the last part of the query lifecycle. It defines what ORM structure will be used for the database data. By default, it is the model instance. It's the instance of the class of the model. 
if we call values, we receive a dictionary. If we call values list, we receive a tuple. And uh, Django 3.0, I think, uh, added the name true, which is actually another structure named tuple. And the reason I'm showing this is if we take a look at the Iterbo class, for example, the one used from uh, dot values, it's a pretty simple implementation. It's just a simple uh, iterable quick iter method that iterate over all the rows fetched from the database and put it into some dictionary. It's basically two lines of uh, implementation. The values list does the same thing, but it returns a list of tuples. The logic here is more complex because it's deciding whether it should be a name tuple or something. And the model iterable, the one that we use for dot .o, is kind of a more complex. It's really more complex than the other. That's why it's slow. So if you have some big table um, that we need all of it from, Using dot .o is not a good idea at all. I'll just run the other example. Hopefully it won't fail. Uh, let me check. APIs. Yep. OK, I'm just making one query here, and uh, my APIs load for a second and a half. And the API, what it's doing is just iterating over some um, iterating over some model or the obvious of, of some model and doing some simple calculation. And if I just just change this dot o method to dot values, which will return a list of dictionaries. Which I need to handle here. Uh, the difference in the speed is it's loading twice faster than before. And it's making the exact same query, but it's keeping all of, uh, all of the logic hidden in the model with terrible. All of this is it's just being skipped. We're just receiving a list of dictionaries and, and do some calculations over them. So here, my rule of thumb is if we have heavier data, which means uh, more fields per object or more objects, uh, we just need a lighter data structure, which is either a tuple or a name tuple. And actually, for the list and detail of APIs, uh, I think the only use case that we would need an ORM object is that if we have some model property that we need to access or we want to update or delete the object. So another use case is this function. What it's doing is that it's iterating over all of the objects provided, all the invoices, and it's attaching some property to the object itself. That's not a good pattern, but sometimes you need to do something like that. You need to get some data, not from the database, but from somewhere else, and just attach it to the object. But this has some disadvantages, because at the moment you say invoices, which is a query set, dot all, all of the properties that you have attached uh, disappear. And if you open the code again, here is the, the API that shows this, this example. We have all the invoices. We are calling the attach if it part dynamically, which is attaching everything. And if I open this API, It is here, but if I say uh, 
invoices.o here after I have attached the property it will just say you don't have this property attached and it will raise an error so this is kind of related to the previous uh, use case because the iterables, the iterable class is not part of the, pub the public uh, ORM interface it's I think it uh, is not described in the documentation, it's not supposed to be overridden, but uh, you have, if you override the, the iterable class, you have the freedom over the last step of the query lifecycle. You have the freedom to put the database data in any structure you want. And what you else have, you have the freedom to implement some metric like uh, map over your uh, over your query set, which will be executed at the moment of loading the data into a data structure. And this will be uh, faster, and this will this will be executed at the last step, at the moment you fetched all everything. And I just implemented this in the demo project. I'll just open my models. So we have the invoice item, and the invoice item has a predefined query set. The predefined query set has just one method, which is called map. It behaves the exact same way as a normal map method. Uh, it accepts a function which accepts an object and return an object. Just apply some function over all of the uh, all of the objects in the query set. So if I run this in the shell, I can say something like invoice item objects dot map, where I put a lambda function. No, I'll just define the function. Attach property. And the function will just attach property ASD equal to one. So I can say invoice item dot objects dot map attach property. Yep. Typo. And I should return the object at the end. Return the object. Okay. So if I get all the items and I access this property, it will be there. If I say something like dot map, I attach the property, then I said dot all, which will return a completely different query set. The property will still be here and will still be here because the logic hidden in the iterable class will always be executed in the last step, the step where you're just loading the data into the ORM structure. So whatever you can hear, dot filter, dot everything, your, your property will, will be there. And it's, it's not the best implementation, it's not the prettiest code, but uh, it gives you the freedom to do whatever you want for the last step. So the rule of thumb here is if you need a custom iterable, just create one, no matter it's not part of the public interface. Okay, and here we have, let's say we have some uh, a really big table with uh, many columns and we want all of them into the in, into our API uh, every object is consuming some memory it's not it's not much but it's consuming some and if we have for example a uh, hundred thousand of objects it could just break the server and the last example Is doing this, we have some heavy model objects, heavy model is some big class. 
it has like 40 fields here just to, to store some data. Uh, and we have two hundred thousand uh, objects. So it's not a good idea to call dot all here. DRM has a dot iterator method, which is used for the dot iterator method is I'm going to open it. Uh, it's, it's calling underscore iterator, which is just building from the iterable class. It's not casting to list anything, it's, and it's not saving anything to the result cache. So it's not it's not uh, taking from your application memory. It's just yielding from it and and yield to whoever is using it. And the last tip is that the extra query doesn't always mean a slow view. Sometimes you just need to make some uh, two or three extra queries and uh, construct everything in, in a Python level. But it's, it's always depends on the use case. So uh, you can check our Django style guide where most of the things are described. Uh, you can check my demo project, which I think we will publish after the after the event. And I hope it was useful. And I will be happy if you have some questions. Uh, Hello. Teddy. Um, it was great, Ivac. Good job. Um, let's see if anybody has questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I can see. Nope. I think I yeah. can see the questions. Are you still there, guys? Did you like the presentation? Okay, let's wait for a while because it takes time. Yep. It was interesting for me, uh, like uh, a person who is uh, not a developer. So <laughs> I'm sure everybody yep. enjoyed. Okay. Uh does anybody has questions? I'll just stop sharing my screen and I'll try to open a chat. Okay, so if, if we don't have questions. We can just um, say thank you very much, uh, everybody who joined us tonight. And uh, big thanks to uh, Launchy Space uh, because uh, we are here thanks to them here in the Hopping platform. Thank you, uh, Ivo, again for this uh, great presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed. One question. You will publish the video. Yes, of course. It's going to be on YouTube in a couple of days and we are going to share uh, on the social media. So stay tuned and you will watch it later. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye. Bye.